go. Good evening, welcome, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Isis Miller, and I have the distinct pleasure of representing Books and Books and the Miami Book Fair in partnership with Lit Hub and Culture Crusaders for this incredible event. Tonight, you'll hear from two dynamic, award-winning authors who have truly changed the landscape in literature. For the rare few who don't know, Britt Bennett's stunning debut novel, The Mothers, was a New York Times bestseller and was all the literary, and my friends too, <laughs> could talk about when it was released in 2016. She's now graced us with The Vanishing at Half, another brilliant work that is again, number one on the New York Times bestseller list. She's a master storyteller, weaving imagination and social commentary in ways that resonate and linger long after you're done with the book. In conversation with her tonight is author Angela Flournoy. Her work, The Turner House, has won multiple awards, including being a finalist for the National Book Award and was named New York Times Notable Book of the Year. We are so excited to be able to bring together two powerhouses in the literary field to share their work with you. Conversations like this are so important as we continue to elevate and amplify the voices, experiences, and stories of people of color and those long left out of the larger conversation. We invite you tonight to listen, learn, and be inspired by what you hear. And for those who have questions, you'll be able to enter those by clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen that says, ask a question. So without further ado, I have the honor of welcoming to the virtual stage, Britt Bennett. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that, uh, that wonderful introduction, Isis. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, thank you to the Miami Book Festival, the Key to Books and Books, um, to Lit Hub, to everyone who's put together this event. Thank you. Angela is going to join me in a few minutes. Um, it's, it's exciting to be here and exciting to be able to talk uh, about the Vanishing app. Um, so I think I'm going to start just with a really quick reading and then um, Angela will join me and we'll, we'll jump into a conversation. So I'm just going to keep it very simple and I'm just gonna read from the first section of the book. So this is the opening to The Vanishing Half. The morning one of the lost twins returned to Mallard, Lou Lebon ran to the diner to break the news. And even now, many years later, everyone remembers the shock of sweaty Lou pushing through the glass doors, chest heaving, neckline darkened with his own effort. The barely awake customers clamored around him, 10 or so, although more would lie and say that they'd been there too, if only to pretend that this once, they'd witnessed something truly exciting. In that little farm town, nothing surprising ever happened, not since the Veen twins had disappeared. But that morning in April, 1968, on his way to work, Lou spotted Desiree Veen walking along Partridge Road carrying a small leather suitcase. She looked exactly the same as when she'd left at 16. Still light, her skin the color of sand, barely wet. Her hipless body reminding him of a branch caught in a strong breeze. She was hurrying, her head bent, and Lou paused here, a bit of a showman. She was holding the hand of a girl, seven or eight, from black as tar. Blue black, he said, like she flown direct from Africa. Lou's egg house splintered into a dozen different conversations. The line cook wondered if it had been Desiree after all, since Lou was turning 60 in May and still too vain to wear his eyeglasses. The waitress said that it had to be. Even a blind man could spot a veen girl and it certainly couldn't have been that other one. The diners abandoning grits and eggs on the counter didn't care about that veen foolishness. Who on earth was that dark child? Could she possibly be Desiree's? Well, who else's could it be, Lou said. He grabbed a handful of napkins from the dispenser, dabbing his damp forehead. Maybe it's an orphan that got took in. I just don't see how nothing that black could have come out Desiree. Desiree seemed like the type to take in no orphan to you? Of course she didn't. She was a selfish girl. If they remembered anything about Desiree, it was that, and most didn't recall much more. The twins had been gone 14 years, nearly as long as anyone had ever known them. Vanished from bed after the Founders Day dance while their mother slept right down the hall. 
One morning, the twins crowded in front of their bathroom mirror, four identical girls fussing with their hair. The next, the bed was empty, the covers pulled back like any other day, taut when Stella made it, crumpled when Desiree did. The town spent all morning searching for them, calling their name through the woods, wondering stupidly if they had been taken. Their disappearance seemed as sudden as the rapture, all of Mallard the sinners left behind. Naturally, the truth was neither sinister nor mystical. The twins soon surfaced in New Orleans, selfish girls running from responsibility. They wouldn't stay away long. City living would tire them out. They'd run out of money and gall and come sniffling back to their mother's porch, but they never returned again. Instead, after a year, the twins scattered, their lives splitting as evenly as their shared egg. Stella became white and Desiree married the darkest man she could find. Now she was back, Lord knows why. Homesick maybe, missing her mother after all those years or wanting to flaunt that dark daughter of hers. In Mallard, nobody married dark. Nobody left either, but Desiree had already done that. Marrying a dark man and dragging his blue black child all over town was one step too far. In Lou's egg house, the crowd dissolved, the line cook snapping on his hairnet, the waitress counting nickels on the table, men in coveralls gulping coffee before heading out to the refinery. Lou leaned against the smudged window, staring out at the road. He ought to call Adele Veen. Didn't seem right for her to be ambushed by her own daughter, not after everything she'd already been through. Now Desiree and that dark child, Lord. He reached for the phone. You think they fixin' to stay? The line cook asked. Who knows? She sure seemed in a hurry though, Lou said. Wonder what she hurrying to? Look right past me, didn't wave or nothing. Uppity, and what reason she got to be uppity? Lord, Lou said. I never seen a child that black before. Thank you. Hello. Silence. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm so happy to hi. be here um, with you. Thank you um, for reading. Uh, yeah, I think I would just jump in. So I'm really excited um, that you have a second book out. That's, that's a big deal <laughs> for me, <laughs> personally. <laughs> And um, I just want to hear uh, a little bit about the road from the mothers to this book. Um, uh, I think you told me before you were thinking about this book before the mothers, but maybe I made that up. It was, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was thinking about it before the mothers came out, um, uh -huh. but, but it was kind of what I was working on sort of in that, or what I started thinking about in that kind of in-between space when the, when the book is done, but before it's been released and you're in that right. weird like anxiety purgatory um so I when I'm anxious it, it helps me just to stay productive and to try to work um so this was something that I turned my attention to um and I'm glad because I didn't have to uh kind of experience publishing a book and then having to face the blank page after that um mm -hmm. I was glad to have something that I was already thinking about a little bit although it was still very early um but yeah, I started thinking about it maybe in 2014, 2015, and then started working on it more in earnest after the mothers was out in the world. Okay. Um, and it is extremely, just shape-wise, it's very different, right? They're two completely different books shape-wise. And so I'm interested in the process from how you went from the mothers, which is, there is a multi-POV angle angle because there's like this collective third, right? Um, so going from something that is mostly just one POV and then this collective third to this sort of multi POV with multiple timelines, was that something you planned from the beginning or did it kind of become its own sort of necessitated, necessitated itself as you started to work on it? Yeah, it, it was not anything I planned. Um, I think if I would have, um, I think if I would have thought about this from the beginning, I would have been just completely intimidated uh, of, of the idea of juggling all of these different perspectives and juggling these timelines. Um, I think like you said, the mothers is, is fairly linear. You know, it's it's mostly one character, although you see a little bit of these other people in her life. 
Um, but there's kind of this, you know, it's sort of a linear coming of age story. And there's uh, there's like a containedness to that, that story. Um, this one was one that just kind of sprawled um, and it spread out in, in all these different directions. And I felt like I was just kind of chasing what interested me about all of these different characters. Um, I thought, I, I think I originally thought it was going to be something like um, almost uh, almost kind of a binary type of like A plot, B plot. And I was going to just kind of bounce between Desiree and Stella and that would be the book. Um, but then I started getting interested in the lives of their children. And I got interested in the lives of these men who, who are in their lives and all of these other people who kind of inhabit the world. The book became so fascinating to me um, that I didn't want to only focus on the twins. I wanted to kind of follow them where, where they ended up. Um, so eventually the book, it kind of became like just characters passing the baton to each other and me kind of like scurrying around, chasing them to see wherever they went. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that your, at least half of your family, one side of your family is from New Orleans, I'm not from New Orleans, but from Louisiana, right? Yes. Um, which is not that uncommon for people who end up in California. Um, yes. My mother's side of the family is also from Louisiana. So one thing that I've found really interesting um, in both books is there's this town Mallard that is, a, I think you read the perfect sort of section to just highlight the priorities of the people in that town. Right? <laughs> Uh, very, very straightforward, which is like, if it's not light, it's not right. And right. <laughs> you're kind of obsessed with it. And that is like the town ethos, right? So you've got this small town that's literally a small town and it's got this central kind of obsession. But in the mothers, it's a larger town. It's, it's Oceanside, right? Mm -hmm. uh, San Diego. But there is a similar small town feeling of surveillance at play. <laughs> uh, <laughs> meaning the, the mothers, these, this sort of chorus of women that show up are all up in everybody's business. Yes. Right? <laughs> and, and I'm just interested in just your experiences with like what it means to be part of like a small community, whether that is sort of in a geographic place or because I imagine in a place like Oceanside, there are people who are not black, but black people still find a way to make their little small towns among yeah. them. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think, I think, yeah, I think actually that last part you said, maybe part of what is so interesting to me about small communities, uh, because, you know, Oceanside is a much larger place, certainly than, than Mallard in this book, and certainly than uh, my mom is from Palmetto, Louisiana, so mm -hmm. certainly larger than a place like that. Um, but I think you're right in the sense of like when you when you have these uh, even larger places, often black people are forming communities within them that are themselves small. <laughs> so even mm -hmm. if you find yourself in a larger place, and I think even back to like my experiences at Stanford when I was in college, um, you know, I, I was a part of a smaller black community within this much larger university. And there certainly was a feeling of surveillance. <laughs> there was a feeling of gossip. I'm sure that's true in, you know, most schools like this, but there was a feeling of gossip. There's a feeling that everyone kind of knew what everyone was doing and everyone was talking about everyone. Um, so I think that, that I haven't actually connected those things together until just now. Thank you, Angela. Um, but I think that they're, they're probably, <laughs> I'm processing a lot right now, but I do think that there's probably, you know, I didn't have the experience of growing up even, um, you know, like in a larger city or a place, you know, I live in, in Brooklyn now or like, you know, and, and obviously there's small communities within even large places, but I think particularly living in these places, uh, where I have fostered black communities within these larger places and those, having the feeling of being part of a small town. I think that is something that, that interests, interests me more at this moment than I think writing about sort of large cities. Right. And there's, um, you mentioned like Stanford, there's certainly that dynamic at like a predominantly white institution. Exactly. Where, uh, all of the people, all the black people know each other. Right? Yes. <laughs> and they know, yes. Or they know of each other if they try to yes. seriously avoid knowing each yes. other. <laughs> and they know, <laughs> And there is a certain feeling of everyone is, it could be really great. Everyone is watching out for each other, but everyone is also just generally watching. Watching each other, each other. exactly. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things that I think, particularly for me, I'm in LA right now. Um, and you were in LA until almost a year ago when you moved yes. to Brooklyn. Uh -huh. um, but you're not from LA. No, my dad is. Um, okay. and. Um, 
the the choice to have the span of this book sort of end in 1980s Eh, is it in the eighties or do we get to the nineties? I think you get like a tiny peak of the nineties, but the the present action it ends in the late eighties. Right. So we're in nineteen eighties LA. So I was reading this novel um, early. Thank you. Um, <laughs> in, in February, and I also happened to just be watching on the Criterion Channel a lot of Charles Burnett films, which are set in early eighties LA, and really focus on the way that people who have migrated, Black people who have migrated from other places ended up in LA and how that kind of informed the communities that they made. Um, those are a lot of small town kinds, whereas mm -hmm. it seems like the people who end up from elsewhere into LA during that time, they seem less interested in those particular kinds of small town, like social constructions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, so my, yeah, my dad is from LA. Um, his uh, mother, so my, my paternal grandmother came from Arkansas. Um, and there's a character in the book who comes from Arkansas and that's kind of where I stole that from. Um, but, but yeah, I was always kind of interested in that, that migration, which I think is written about a lot less than people who left South and went to uh, Northern cities and, you know, went to Chicago or went to New York or went to Detroit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am, I'm interested in, in that kind of, uh, that westward migration and just how that kind of leads into these sort of myths of the West as, as a place of reinvention or a place of discovery um, or a place, place of um, sort of self-creation. Um, I I, there's not a lot in the book about that, but there was, there was ways in which I, I, I was kind of thinking about these tropes of Westerns and, and you know, cowboys or whatever, all of these things kind of bleeding into the sort of very American myth of what the West represents and how in the ways in which that has been kind of reinterpreted or, or experienced differently by Black people making that sort of migration themselves. I actually think that there's a lot in the book that kind of uh, <laughs> deals, deals with those tropes of a sort of like Western reinvention and you can come here and become anyone. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that really impressed me about this book is the way that the idea of passing is sort of reflected and refracted through everybody, right? So you've got um, you've got Blake, uh, Stella's white husband, who's sort of passing as this kind of more relaxed California <laughs> sort of like <laughs> like businessman. They've got this pool, and it seems like there's a different kind of like largesse at play than probably how he with the kind that he grew up with right uh -huh. and then there's obviously everyone else in this community who they've got this this ideal about the kind of neighborhood that they're going to have and so even though they've gone west uh, what a lot of people don't realize about southern california they think that we're just you know really progressive and have always been very right. racially progressive that ain't true yes. right? <laughs> so, they want to have a, a, a sort of California lifestyle, but they want to inoculate themselves from blackness, right? They right. don't want any sort of, in, they have no interest in blackness and they're sort of, they're passing as having this sort of, this easier California lifestyle, but it still has all of the trappings of wherever they came from before that was <laughs> probably just as segregated, right? Right, right. And maybe less so. Right. <laughs> um, because sometimes people just in historically lived closer together than people ended up living like in, in Southern California. Right, Southern California. <laughs> right. And so you could put a freeway between you. You can put like yes. a mountain range. Yes. And you just put um, gates. A, a yeah. Gate. Exactly. Be in a gated community and then you kind of dealt with it. Exactly. Yeah. I think that that was, that was something that I, cause I didn't want, I think, as I said, I was, I was interested in these kind of myths of the West, but I also did not want to, uh, lean into that interpretation that you just described that they go to the West and suddenly racism is solved. And suddenly, you know, <laughs> she's left Louisiana. So now she's like entered this like liberating space. Um, I, I was interested in the ways that, uh, that these, this sort of way that she experienced racism as a black woman in Louisiana is, is different than the way that race is experienced in California, but it's still experienced, you know, that the idea of segregation, 
um, being enforced now, not by, you know, signs of drinking fountains, but by homeowners associations and by lawyers and by, um, you know, these types of, of actions that are different than what this character experienced for. And not only her witnessing that, but also having to enact it herself and having to perform it herself and always kind of performing it wrong. So I, I liked the idea that she has learned the, the scripts of whiteness as a black woman in Louisiana. And then when she goes to perform those scripts, she's performing them inappropriately because she is no longer in Louisiana. Now she's in LA and she is supposed to be a different type of white person that she has never experienced. Um, right. So she's constantly like trying to catch up during this performance and constantly doing it wrong. And she's also, it's the thing that I think you do really well and really definitely is that she, because she comes from this other sort of sometimes much, much more overt and aggressive kind of racism, she can also figure out how to sort of tap at the cracks in the sort of good white person facade of some of her neighbors when she wants to, right? <laughs> yes. So when she decides like she doesn't want to be Loretta's friend anymore, like <laughs> she knows exactly what to say. Yeah. Just what kind of suggestion to make and to whom to get their sort of the dog whistle that maybe the other ones would it take them longer to get to. She knows exactly <laughs> how to get there. Because right. she's not new to this. Like she this <laughs> she's not self-deluding, right? Right. I mean, I think that that's part of what's interesting, I think, about passing and, and just the experience of being marginalized in some way is that you learn the rules, you know, you have to know them. So she mm -hmm. learns the rules of how whiteness operates because she has to know it as, as, a, as a, a matter of survival. And then she is then able to use them as, as sort of a weapon when she needs to use them. Right. Um, so I want to pause. Um, last The first time we did a talk together, <laughs> I tortured you with, I think it was five at the time. It was way too many. I remember that. <laughs> from five like desert island books. Uh -huh. But you, you were a good sport. And so uh -huh. now I'm just going to ask you for three. Okay. And instead of just sort of broad, the books you would take on a desert island, I would say to be more appropriate to this moment, either books that are appropriate for a, a pandemic that necessitates isolation slash... <laughs> Books that are appropriate for a revolution, you can choose. <laughs> okay, can I do a mixture mixture of both since that is the moment that we are in? Um, no. Do you want all three of them right now or do you want them? No, just one. Just one? Okay. You can come back, yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> one I will say for Pandemic, I will say is the book Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. Um, mm. It's a novel about uh, these all of these people from all over the world who are at a, uh, like a fancy, um, I guess dinner party or an event at somebody's house and they are then taken hostage in this house and everybody is held there for I forgot how much time. Um, but all of these people who do speak all of these different languages are trapped together in a house. Um, and <laughs> there's a way in which it's kind of an, the anti-social distancing book, um, but also the, I, the fact that this novel all takes place entirely in a house feels uh, appropriate right now. And um, just the idea of, of being able to experience the world and being able to experience all of these relationships and tensions and, and thinking about language and, and how we communicate and how we fail to communicate, all of that happening in a really um, enclosed physical space is something that I always marvel at when I think about that book. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, you talk about bottle episodes of TV. It's a bottle novel. Um, and it's hard to, it's, I mean, I can't imagine how you even conceive of doing that, um, and let alone in a way that ends up being really beautiful and moving. Um, so I think having been in my apartment since March, um, <laughs> um, but alone and not with, you know, dozens and dozens of, of strangers, um, it, it's a book that I've been thinking about, of, of thinking of how you can be changed and how you can experience a lot, even if you have not left the physical space that you're in. Excellent. So you've been alone <laughs> since March. Yes. <laughs> what did? How did you celebrate when you found out you were on the number one on the bestseller list? It was huge. I drank champagne alone. That's how I celebrated. Okay. I had um. <laughs> I had, you a, had a normal quarantine night. <laughs> yes, I had a normal quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> I had um I had a Zoom uh, with my publisher, so that was nice. We had like a impromptu Zoom room of my uh, okay. editor, my my agent, my publicist, and um all, a bunch of other people who are um, at Riverhead. So we had a Zoom, and that was really nice to see everybody's face. Um and and then yeah, I just I had a, a 
I had champagne alone. So it was a little bit fancier than normal quarantine night. I have to say, I don't think I've ever drank. I've never had champagne alone before. Like I've always been at a party or you I've been with somebody. So that was a, a kind of weird experience. Um, but I was like, I've got to like pop a bottle of something. This is such a insane thing that I'm experiencing. And the fact that I'm experiencing it alone, like I need to at least be tipsy as I'm like going through the emotions of this. <laughs> And did you play any music? I did. It's really embarrassing. I don't want to reveal the song. Um, okay. I, I just I'm like just interested in the Brit Bennett victory song. But that's okay. <laughs> there's a victory. So, there's a victory song. I will not reveal <laughs> it. But um, I told myself when I realized that I was going to be going through publication alone, I was like, okay, I need like a song. So if I get good news, I can like play that song as a victory. Uh, it's completely cheesy. Um, but but that's you that it to me. You don't have to tell people. <laughs> I need to know, but you don't have to tell people. Fine. I can't tell. I can't tell people. Sorry, I'll text you later, Angela. But um, but so it's super okay. cheesy, but also just one of those songs that just makes you really happy. Um, and and it has been like a nice way to to kind of experience the anxieties of, of publishing when you're trapped in an apartment by yourself. <laughs> Very well adjusted of you to come up with a plan ahead of time. <laughs> um, very smart. Thank you. Because like, um, if not, you can just like end up knocking on neighbors' doors. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Hello, I've got news to share. <laughs> uh, um, well, thank you. So, kind of going back to, um, we talked a little bit about this like idea of reinvention. Um, obviously, this is a novel about passing. So it's like baked in there, this idea of performing and figuring out like, who do I want to be? Um, and it, so reading the book made me think about the moments in my own life where there was that decision to be made. One of them is like, you go to college, right? Or you move mm -hmm. to a new place. Like, mm -hmm. if, am I turning over a new leaf? And if so, how literally am I going to do that? Right. Um, like I have friends who've had like three different names. Like I knew them growing up with one name and then right. they went to college and they were like, this is my name. Right. And then in grad school, they were like, this is my name. And right. these are decisions we make, right? And there are people who are extremely grumpy about that and don't refuse to right. you know, call you by the new name. <laughs> and there are people like me who for the most part, I'm just like, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in just the sort of less obvious kinds of passing, like what you thought kind of intentionally were the sorts of passing that you wanted to embed or explore in the novel? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I'm, I'm interested in all, in all of these things that you just said of the idea of, of deciding to be a different person in some way. Um, I am somebody who like, you know, fantasizes about this a lot, like the idea of just moving someplace completely new where nobody knows you. Um, it's one of the reasons why I, I like traveling alone. <laughs> uh, I love going to a city where I know nobody and just walking around with headphones on. Uh, and I miss I miss that in our our current um, COVID world. Um, and there's something I think that's so liberating about being in a new place and thinking like I could be anybody here, you know. And I think that that part of what you're saying of sometimes people who know you or people in your life are resistant to the idea of you changing or the idea of you being different. Uh, and that can feel really uh, can make you feel really trapped, um, even if even if some of these these changes are these smaller scale changes. Not to mention these larger ones that some of the characters in the in the book experience. Uh, so I think that that was something that was on my mind a lot too. The idea of passing um, is not just this sort of you know, you know way to transgress these racial uh, these racial categories, but also just this idea of wanting to be a new person. And if I want to be a new person, then who can stop me? Like why should anybody else's opinion about that matter if this is my one life to live and I want to live it as a different person, you know? And, and that's something that I'm very um, sympathetic towards. And, and like I said, I understand the desire personally to just kind of shed your past and start over. Um, so I wanted, I think that that was a way in which Stella became more um, intelligible to me um, because, you know, even if I don't understand or if I don't agree with, uh, her desire to, or her decision rather to be a white woman, um, uh, and the sort of harmful implications that come from that, um, uh, I definitely understand this desire just to be a new person than the person that you once were. Um, I really want to commend you on the way that you made 
there are two people who, well, there are multiple people who leave where they are from and see what happens when they go somewhere else. But there are two people who make a very conscious decision to leave where they are from and never return, right? And they are, the person who they were before is not who the person they are now. So you have Stella and then you have Reese. And one thing that really impressed me was the way that Stella's decisions are framed as sort of both necessity and just kind of like opportunistic, whereas Reese's decisions are framed as necessity, but also a natural sort of evolution of identity, right? So they're not running from anything they're sort of right. running towards something versus like running from something right um and i thought that that was a really a kind of a really sort of deft demarcation in the book is there are people who both of these people people might argue are passing or for some period of time they were attempting to do that but one of these people it is an outcropping of sort of like genuine genuine like attainment of true identity versus right sort of a ex expulsion of identity right yeah i mean i think those characters of recent style are, are are interesting to me and, and these people who re both reinvent themselves in these in these different ways as you were saying um but also um the idea that reese's journey is is um is one towards uh sort of affirming who he is and affirming who he has been um, mm -hmm. versus Stella's journey, which is really uh, sort of shedding who she's been or, or becoming somebody else kind of mentally and emotionally. Um, mm -hmm. And I also, I remember I had a friend who read an early draft of the, of the book and was, and was pointing out that um, even both Reese and Stella have very different kind of survival strategies because uh, Reese never embodies like a toxic masculinity. He doesn't become this kind of nightmare um, sort of masculine figure in a book where there are some nightmarish masculine figures. Um, while Stella does begin to embody white supremacy and does begin to enact it. And my friend was like, I like that because it demonstrates that those strategies are choices. You know, there are choices in, in how you can behave if, uh, when you become somebody different. Um, and I think even just their strategies are so different. And, and that was something that uh, I don't know how intentional I was about that. But when he pointed it out to me, that was something that I, I really liked. Uh, the idea that that just because you have become somebody new does not mean that you have to embody, you know, whatever it is about this this new identity. Um, so so I, I liked those characters as, as sort of counterpoints to each other. Um, and and at the same time, this idea, again, of 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 these characters both having agency and deciding to act on their agency in order to to change their lives in a way that they want to change their lives. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about before, Stella is fluent in the ways of whiteness. This is why she's able to weaponize it. And Reese, of course, because who isn't sort of fluent in the ways of right. toxic masculinity, right. but he never chooses to right. weaponize it. Um, right. Which, yeah, that... Um, that was good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so oh, another thing that I'm um, kind of getting back to thinking about the structure of this book and how it was developed. This book um, is nonlinear, but there are these sort of moments where it feels like it almost is because the way that like one storyline is going this way, one storyline is going this way, and then there's like electricity happening. And sometimes <laughs> they overlap in this way that maybe there's like a small coincidence that connects them. And then sometimes it's maybe it's just because it's like two people falling in love, et cetera. I just want to know how much work that was. <laughs> Talk about that. That sounds so smart when you describe it like that, Angela. I'm like, I don't know that I thought about this it. This is what I'm that. here to do for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I think, I mean, to answer your question, it was a lot of work. Um, it took many drafts to to sort of um, figure out how the story was going to come together. And I think that like when, when my friends started reading early drafts and people were responding um, as, as the book was kind of done, but you know, when we're like in the galley stage, like when you read it, um, I would have friends uh, compliment me on it. And I just, I couldn't really see, um, 
what was good about the book because I only saw the work that had gone into like moving the pieces of the story and like moving them in place. And, you know, I described the process as my editor to my editor as arduous. And she was like, well, it didn't feel like that for me. And I was like, well, it did for me. <laughs> I'm glad it didn't feel like that for you, but it certainly felt um, often quite frustrating for me because um, again, like I kept thinking to myself, like, you, why didn't you just write this in a linear way? Or why didn't you just write this uh, in a way that was more straightforward? But that that did not feel emotionally honest. It felt like this was a story about a fractured family. It was a story about um, these sort of fractured relationships and that the structure of the book needed to speak to that, that the sort of there being pieces and there being fractured and there being kind of these lines that are going and sort of directions, um, these different directions, instead of it feeling like we're on the same track with the same timeline and the same sort of stories. Um, so it felt like it need the structure of the book needed to speak to that fracturing that's happening in the story. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it, so, yeah, I knew, I knew generally, I knew that there, um, I knew I wanted to start with Desiree returning the, the section I just read where she's returned from this kind of mysterious absence and Stella has already vanished into the wind. Um, I knew that at some point in the book, these storylines would converge in some way. Um, and that was kind of all I knew writing it. I just knew that that, the, I knew those two moments. Um, I didn't know how it was going to end. I didn't know anything really that was going to happen in between. Um, so it took a lot of drafts to try to figure out how to make uh, the story make sense and how to um, kind of represent the sort of, yeah, that broken family, the sort of brokenness in this, uh, in this family and represent that structurally. Um, I really think that the, the impulse to start with the return is the right one. And it really makes you think about um, there's, there's just images that I think about in literature of, of like a certain kind of woman coming back to a town that she was never supposed to come back to. So right. I think of like Toni Morrison's Sula is one character. Right. It's like, what's she doing back here? Right. Um, <laughs> and Sula's grandmother before her right. back without a leg. What's she doing back here? And what happened to her leg? Right. right. Um, and I also was thinking more recently of Cynthia Bond's Ruby and Ruby comes back to this town and mm -hmm. she's there's all of this sort of like fraught implications of like, what is she doing back here? Right. Um, so these are, these are good traditions to be in. Um, <laughs> another book. <if> you would <laughs> I, well, first of all, I love that that is like a genre of literature, the what is she doing back here? Like, that's great. I would mm -hmm. read, I would take a class on, on just that type of book. Um, what is she doing back here? That is yes, the title. Yes, <laughs> that's the title of the book. Um, yeah. Okay, second book, I guess so speaking, I guess, maybe speaking more to, to the revolution side of things. Um, I mean, this is a pretty easy answer, I think, but I would, I would say The Color Purple uh, by Alice Walker. I think that's um, one of my favorite books. Um, I think I read that book before I saw the movie. Um, and what is Suge Avery doing back here? <laughs> yes, there you go. That's also <laughs> what is she doing back here book. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're designing the syllabus right now. We're good. Um, <laughs> real time. So, yes, in real time. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think that, that that book speaks to, I mean, first of all, it's just a beautiful moving story. It's a story of sisterhood, uh, which is obviously a theme that I'm interested in. Um, and uh, and people who are, uh, I guess, there, well, I guess there's a little bit. There's people who are distant from each other and, and apart from each other and, and struggling to sort of communicate um, across distance and time. So I guess that does resonate maybe um, during the, the quarantine. Um, but I think also just its thematics about uh, about um, what, it, what it means to experience racialized violence and gendered violence and gendered violence that's racialized. Um, I think that's certainly something that a lot of us are talking about right now um, um, about the sort of intersectionality of these experiences and how they must be considered and, and, and addressed. Um, so I think that that book, you know, thinking of it particularly as a book that was, uh, and also a film that was controversial for that very reason, um, the idea that by speaking about the violence that Black women suffer at the hands of Black men uh, was considered to be sort of anti-Black man, um, that those are sort of conversations that you still see ongoing. Um, but I think the, the, the themes of that book, um, the ways in which as uh, Black women, we can form communities um, and relationships and bond with 
and among each other and, and be liberated through those experiences. That's something that I find like almost holy. Like I think of this book is sort of like an almost holy book. <laughs> so um, I, I think that it, it speaks to a lot of things that, that are on my mind right now. And I think on a lot of, on a lot of our minds. As you were talking, I was thinking of the um, of their eyes are watching God, which is also what is she what is she doing, doing back here? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <Okay. laughs> we can continue that offline. Um, yes. I do want to open it up for questions, and I'll ask you for your last book at okay. some point during these questions. Okay. Cool. But it looks like there are a few that are here that I will just uh, choose from. Okay. Um, Um, the, the people want to know the song. Diane wants to know the song. Um, <laughs> we, we have to let a person in quarantine have their private things because then they're not as special, you know. It's true. Um, all of us know. Um, so, um, here is a good question. Uh, the introduction of Reese and his relationship with Jude was a surprising turn in the story. We talked about this a little bit, if you, but if you have more to say about what inspired Reese's journey in particular. Yeah, I mean, Reese, uh, Reese is actually a character that I had been thinking about. I had written a, a story about Reese in workshop. Um, it was a very different story. It had nothing to do with this book. It was, it was about a um, I guess it was a what is he doing back here story because it was a story about him returning to his hometown for a funeral. Um, and this was like a story I had written and it was just very sad and miserable. And he was a character who was going through like this breakup. And it was just a story about a like a guy being sad. Um, and, and that was kind of that. Um, when I started thinking about this book, I knew that I wanted to write a love story for Jude uh, in part just because she experiences so much hardship in the early part of the book um, that I really wanted to write a story about her leaving Mallard and, and discovering friendship and community and love in this other place. Um, and I started to think about Reese as this character uh, who also had been like kind of bludgeoned in this other uh, thing I had written where he uh, again was kind of the sad sack character. Um, and I started to think about the two of them together. So he was kind of, salvaged from this thing that I had abandoned that I was working on in I don't know, 2012 um, and, and kind of brought to life, I think, in, in a so much better way in this book than he had previously kind of functioned. Um, so there was like a kind of personal feeling about this, um, this character who I had thought a lot about that just was not working in the story that he was existing in um, that kind of allowed me to sort of uh, pair off these two characters um, and I think for me, I, I, I wanted to write this love story with these two characters in part because I think that they both experience, um, again, they experience so much shame and violence surrounding their bodies um, in these two very different ways. Um, and I, I wanted to think about the ways in which they would, um, I, I wanted to see them kind of struggle to learn how to love each other and learn how to love themselves uh, in spite of this, this shame and violence. Um, they're both sort of guarded people. They're both, um, you know, they're, they're both, they both kind of struggle with trust and intimacy um, for these very legitimate reasons. Um, but for me, there's something really moving about watching people struggle with these types of things and, and, and you know, learning how to love each other through it. Um, so I don't know. I, I wanted to write a story about, um, you know, I, I don't think like, I just wanted to write a story about people who like love and respect each other. <laughs> and <laughs> I feel like that should not, that should not be so rare, but you know, I don't, I don't know that there was one like that in the mothers. <laughs> I think that those, there were, there were love stories of the mothers. They were pretty toxic, you know? So this was like kind of my first chance to write a love story that actually felt sort of tender and pure um, and good when I was writing it. So who knew, um, who knew such a thing was possible uh, in fiction, but, <laughs> but, um, but that was, that was kind of how I, I started thinking about this character. So um, I, you know, I kind of stumbled into him joining this book um, and then obviously realized later like, oh yeah, the thematics of his world, the thematics of his journey kind of uh, resonates with some of these other thematics that I'd already created. Um, and I just really liked the character. So uh, so it was fun for me to to write that love story. And, and it's uh, it's great to hear that people enjoy it. That's that's the relationship that people have been talking to me most about since they've started reading the book. 
um, I think that there are many things that I like about their relationship, but on a very superficial level, it was very sort of <laughs> rewarding to me that Reese is good looking because there's this that beautiful evil, I've blocked out his name on purpose, uh, <laughs> Mallard boy. <laughs> It's just so careless with Jude's emotions. Yes. And I'm like, yes, this is not the last beautiful man in her life. Uh, yes. <laughs> so we can do this. Um, but there's also one thing that Reese's character provides. Um, and one thing that I think speaks to the larger sort of like, you know, just the sort of terrible deleterious effects of colorism is that it's so hard as a reader to get an understanding of what Jude looks like because yeah. she has no understanding of what she really yeah. looks like because the place that she lives in has decided that like to be dark is to be ugly. And right. so there's like a complete disconnect between like what is actually happening and yeah. what people are telling her is happening. Um, so that moment when we get Reese's POV of what he sees is like, oh, yeah, <laughs> just, there's, it's um, it's a deft way to sort of help us understand psychologically like the ramifications of having to live like that. Right. And we also understand that there's also there's really not a way to under to get a get a gauge of how like how dark is she? Like I have right. no idea because she really has no idea. Right. <laughs> like, because the world that she lives in is so obsessed with not being dark at all that right. Like, right there's this um so there's this feeling that she is blue black but then and i'm like that is beautiful but is right. she because i feel like <laughs> walking around la she probably saw people darker than her right right that weren't in this town right um, no i like how i like how you describe that sort of disconnect um because i, I do think that 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 is one of the things that i want to think about with this book is the idea of colorism is not just something that's kind of an abstract topic that we discuss or an abstract issue, but something that is embodied right. and something that you experience and that you feel. Um, so particularly with Jude, when I started to think, okay, she's going to leave Mallard, she's going to go to LA, um, she's left this physical place behind, but she still carries all of that with her. You know, she still carries it with her, even though she knows intellectually that you know this is a this is a bad ideology. She still carries it with her, and that um, actually makes her. It's one of the things that makes her relationship with Reese quite difficult because she's kind of skeptical that he could actually like her. Actually, thinks that she's beautiful. Um, she finds it so hard to allow herself to trust him for all of these past things that she's experienced, and has to try to find a way to kind of liberate herself from that. Gonna see about the questions. Um, I think you can still ask a question if you have a burning <clears throat> desire to do so. Um, <laughs> what have you been listening to during quarantine? Isis would like to know. Oh. And since you're not gonna tell us about your special song. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. What have I been listening to during quarantine? Um, I've been listening to, uh, I don't know if I've listened to any like albums. I have various playlists. I have a playlist of just like sad songs <laughs> that I like to listen to when I'm writing. Um, so I've, I've been playing that. Um, I, I uh, am working on a new project that is uh, surrounding a, um, a, a 1960s girl group. Um, so I've been listening to lots of girl group music, uh, which has been very pleasing to me. Um, I, I have a playlist of that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've been listening to, uh, yeah, a lot of um, 80s pop music. Um, that's been more recent because uh, I feel like, I don't know, now that the, the, the sun is shining, things feel a little bit less apocalyptic, so I can listen to something that's a little bit more upbeat. Um, but but yeah, I think it's a lot of it has been um, the, the sort of uh, girl group music. I've been listening to a lot of Dusty Springfield. Um, I've been listening to some mm. disco. Um, so this is kind of circling around what the, the next, next project is, which is, it's a book about music. Uh, so it's been fun to make playlists specific for kind of the time in which the book is set. And, um, and also it's just music. That's great music. Um, so it's been fun to just, yeah, be able to listen to the Supremes all day or listen to Martha and the Vandellas all day or anything like that. Thank you. 
Um, excellent. So this is a question that I'm interested in. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Bye -bye. clears throat> The Vanishing Half, uh, Rachel asks, The Vanishing Half has so many characters who are ultimately really nice. How did you think about driving the story without a traditional villain to move things forward? I'm always interested in the idea of literary fiction and a villain. Ooh, that's really interesting. You know, I, I guess, I don't know. I don't, I guess I don't often think, I don't often write villains or think about villains when I'm writing. I'm thinking about, the other things that I've written, I guess, the, I guess the mother's the the preacher's wife is a is a little villainous. I guess she's sort of villainous, uh, but but yeah, I mean, you know, annoying, for sure. yes, <laughs> sometimes that's enough, you know, like right, you know, I yeah, I think that I I'm I just I mean, at the risk of sounding really cheesy, um, I just I like stories about people who are trying their best and. That doesn't mean that these characters are perfect, but like stories about people trying to take care of each other, even if they fail to do so, that's just what really moves me. And I'm way more moved by that or more interested in that even than stories about like people being you know jerks to each other. I, 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 it's hard for me to really, I, that was one of the reasons why it took me uh, a while to like start watching Succession, which I enjoy, um, but I was just like, oh, is this just, about people being like assholes, like I'm not, you know, so I, and, and I do enjoy, I think it's a fun show, but like that though, that's the type of entertainment that I'm like most reluctant to engage with where it's, where that's where the enjoyment comes from of people like being conniving or people, you know, I'm just I'm less interested in that than in stories about people trying to and failing to take care of each other. And, and, and that's just kind of the way I'm oriented, I think as a reader and as a writer. Um, so for me, I, I, I usually don't think of the tension in the story coming from the character struggling as, against some type of villain. Um, often, you know, there are these villainous forces, I think that's true, whether those forces are, you know, in this case, there's, you know, the colorism that's running rampant within this town of Mallard and that is, and, and outside of this town that's, you know, that is, uh, you know, running rampant throughout America, throughout the world and how we, struggle within these really problematic um, ideologies that we inherit and then sometimes pass on to others. Um, I thought of that as kind of a villainous force or these other forces of violence or um, bigotry that are existing in the book. Um, but I think, you know, there are these characters that pop up, like the, the, the boy that you mentioned, Angela, the Mallard boy, who's um, horrible to Jude, like he's a character that pops up briefly, does something, you know, does, the, does these villainous things and then just kind of is dispatched with um, and I think that, that that's kind of my, my bit, I think, as a writer, where I'm more interested in thinking about how Jude is struggling against uh, this, you know, the sort of trauma that she's inherited from her experience with this person than I am thinking about her kind of struggling against a particular person or any of these characters struggling against one particular person. Um, another good question from Isis. Um, Nina and Simone said, an artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. As a Black creator, how does that resonate with you? And how do you see your role as a writer in reflecting the times in which we are living? That's, it's tough. Um, I, I do think about this um, a bunch. Um, you know, I think that, that this was one thing even I thought about with The Vanishing Half, because, you know, the book is set uh, in 1968, set in a different um, sort of historical time period. Um, and the time in which I was writing it was kind of during this rise of Trump um, and during this sort of time period in which um, it felt like the country was becoming uh, even more nostalgic than it generally is. This sort of make America great again, um, kind of backward looking uh, vantage point. And I was very troubled by that. Um, and also wondered if by writing a book set in the past, I was kind of looking away from the, the horrors of the present. Um, and I think that sometimes looking to the past can feel um, comforting and, uh, and, and sort of this, this comforting idea uh, because you're able to kind of distance yourself from the events of the past. And you're also able to think like, well, look how far we've come, you know? <laughs> and I knew that that wasn't how I thought about the past generally. And, but I didn't want to give the reader that kind of safety blanket of being able to read this book and think like, well, we're not like, 
you know, those people in this book. Um, and there was a part of me that worried that writing a book that's set in the past during this time in which everyone was taking comfort and nostalgia was kind of, um, it was kind of, uh, you know, further sort of reinforcing that, that, um, that way of thinking that really troubled me. And not only that, but also something that was, um, I felt like it was kind of me sort of shirking my, um, not even responsibility, but the idea of being like a, uh, you know, I'm a millennial, I'm a young, <laughs> I'm a millennial writer. And like the idea that like, well, maybe I should be writing about what it's like to be a millennial um, instead of writing about this book and then this new thing that's about a 60s girl group, you know, like, so there was a way in which I, I think I felt worried that I was, I was kind of not doing that by, by looking to the past. Um, but I think that being said, I guess how I've, how I've come to think about it is, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in these relationships between time and the way that you can, um, you can look to the past in a way that sheds light on the present in a different way. Um, and that's something that, that I, I hope that the vanishing half does, uh, that by kind of looking to this almost mythologized past, it's not a, you know, it's not a sort of strict historical novel in the way that some of these historical novels are very like, uh, you know, very, I think about like, uh, Jennifer Egan's Manhattan Beach, which is just like mm -hmm. so intricately researched and like, you're like, this person knows everything about scuba diving during World War II. Um, this is The Vanishing Half is not that book. It's really interested in kind of memory and mythology. Um, and a lot of that was sort of memory and mythology handed to me through my family. Um, but I think thinking about the past as, as something that's more myth felt like a more liberating way to write about the past that did not allow me to be nostalgic. It did not allow me to um, even distance myself from it or, or try to sanitize the past. I think it allowed me a way to to kind of write, write toward the past in a way that uh, I think refracted how I was experiencing race and identity and all of these things in this moment. Um, so that's a very roundabout way of answering that question. Um, but I, but I think you know, I, I, I think that um, I'm always interested in, in telling stories and telling stories that speak to the moment. Um, and I hope that my my work is doing that in some way that that feels um, that feels fresh and that feels new. Um, that was a really good answer. And that would be a really good answer to end on if, if I didn't need one more book. <laughs> I just have to have. I'm sorry. Um, but I just need it. I just need this one last book. <laughs> and, then, and then we get it. Okay. Well, I will say, um, so I, I, I will go with, um, another country by James Baldwin, um, which, was a book that I started reading when I was in college and then was like, ooh, this is too depressing. I can't read this and put it down and came back to it. <laughs> came back to it years later. I don't know what it what it says about, you know, my life in my late twenties where I was in the headspace to to engage. Um, but I was. And, you know, I think it's 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 also, you know, such a, a beautiful book. Um, I think um it's it's it feels kind of surreal reading books about uh, you know, people like frolicking in New York or people like congregating, all of those things feel surreal right now um, of reading about that. But this sort of collection of all of these characters, um, all of these characters experiencing race and gender and sexual identity and all of these different ways. Uh, I, it's, it's such a dense and heavy book. It's something that weighs on you. Um, but, I, but I, I, you know, I'm always drawn to, to Baldwin's fiction. I, I think a lot of people are talking about his nonfiction uh, a lot nowadays, I think um, very understandably. But the first thing by Baldwin I ever read was Go Tell on the Mountain. Um, you know, I, I, I was introduced to him as a novelist. And I think that there's always such, I think heavy, there's always such heaviness to his language and the sentences. And there is that feeling of a sermon or, or that feeling of, um, of perhaps sitting in a church and not wanting to experience a sermon necessarily, but just that, that, that sort of heaviness of, of, of that you can tell from that tradition that, that he is writing. Um, so I think that another country is, is, uh, is a book that, that does have that heaviness of tone and, and, and theme when you're reading it, but is a really beautiful book and is, uh, is definitely uh, worth reading in this moment. Excellent. Um, 
I appreciate you. <laughs> I congratulate you on this book. Thank um, you. Thank you for being a good sport. Um, and thank you for a wonderful conversation. No, thank you for doing this, Angela. I, I really appreciate it. It was so great to, to talk with you. It was my pleasure. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Um, so yes, that was an incredible conversation. And thank you for everyone for tuning in. I think um, as I was sharing with the ladies a little earlier, one of the, I guess, good things that comes out of this is that we're able to do things like this where we can bring two incredible people in a room together and really share it and broadcast it with everyone and everyone has access to these types of conversations. Um, that was amazing. I'm sorry, I'm still fangirling. So. <laughs> Don't look at my face if I'm like sweating <laughs> and, and just in adoration. But I just, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you to Books and Books and the Miami Book Fair for continuing to spotlight voices like yours um, and especially Black women. Like right now, it is so important that we hear from Black women. Our stories are so important um, and we need it to be elevated. We need it to be spotlighted. And whether it's it's telling the stories from the past or envisioning a future where we exist and we thrive that is what we need most right now so again thank you to you ladies and for our, our those who are viewing if you look at the bottom of your screen there's a button that says purchase the vanishing hat so <laughs> if you haven't already bought this or even if you have and you want to gift it to your friends obviously go ahead click on that button purchase the vanishing half and purchase turner house we are so, so happy that you guys were able to join us today. So, so grateful. So thank you again. And we look forward to the next time. Thank and so, you. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at your Twitter, Britt, to see if you're going to post that song. <laughs> I'm sorry, mine, you want to know. Like, we are so intrigued. How would you do us like that? Like, how would you do us like that? We want to know. That was <laughs> dangling the carrot, and that's not fair. But okay, keep your secrets during quarantine. That's okay. Um, but yes, again, we're so grateful for you being here. And Thank you. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank pleasure. You. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.